Hey everyone, you're listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast in which philosophers, theologians, and literary critics discuss how literature can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. I am your host, Jennifer Frey. I am an associate professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina. You can find me on Twitter at Jen Frey, on Instagram at Professor S. Frey, and you can also find the podcast on Twitter. Our handle is at Pod. In this episode, I'm joined by Justin E.H. Smith, philosopher, substacker, and podcaster, who joined me to discuss Cormac McCarthy's Sotri. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Sacred and Profane Love. I'm really excited this afternoon to be joined by Justin Smith. Justin is a professor of philosophy in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Paris. He is also now a sub-stacker, and his sub-stack happens to be my favorite sub-stack, so I highly recommend it. That's justinehsmith.substack.com. And, you know, he's a philosopher, he's a writer, but he's also a podcaster. So Justin has a podcast called What is X, which I believe is sponsored or underwritten by The Point magazine. As everybody knows, I'm a huge fan of The Point, and I am also a huge fan of Justin's podcast in addition to his Substack. So I'm just very excited to welcome Justin Smith to the podcast. Thank Hi, you. Justin. Hi, I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited. And yeah, so you chose a novel that I hadn't read and that I just finished reading this morning. And I sort of feel like I'm just beginning to wrap my mind around. And that is Cormac McCarthy's fourth fourth novel, which is called Sutri. And it's wonderful. I loved it. There's a there's a lot going on. Mm. And so I guess I'm just going to start by asking why you chose this novel. I think there are at least three reasons why I chose it. One is that, as I think I've told you or you've read of me recently, I'm on a Proust uh, binge. That is to say, I'm reading all seven volumes of In Search of Lost Time from start to finish. And I'm haunted as I'm reading this uh, by something Cormac McCarthy said of Henry James and Marcel Proust, which is, I don't understand them. To me, that's not literature. A lot of writers who are considered good, I consider strange. That's McCarthy on Proust. And the problem, Mm -hmm. McCarthy thinks, as he puts it, is that such authors don't deal with issues of life and death. That's what he says. So to me, has been a compelling reason to go and alternate Proust and McCarthy. Henry James is left out of the, the, Mm -hmm. the, this is not a triangulated uh, back and forth, but Mm -hmm. I felt like I had to understand better what this difference that McCarthy was trying to identify really was because on my reading of Proust, obviously we're not here to talk about Proust today and I promise I'll drop him in a second. On my (laughs) reading of Proust, it is about life and death. In fact, it's all about how you kind of prop up an appearance of life and a staving off of death by elaborate social conventions and and mm-hmm. social hierarchy and and courtliness and so on and so on mm-hmm. so you don't have to be actively cutting off the soles of somebody's foot and making them walk a hundred miles across salt flats like happens in McCarthy's Blood Meridian in order mm-hmm. in order to be engaging with death, right? right? And yet it's undeniable that there's a sense in which, or there's a register at which McCarthy engages with life and death that Proust does not. So I've been thinking about that a lot recently. So that's one reason. A second reason is that ever since I've been in France, which is since 2013 now, I'm like it or not, quite against any will of my own, obsessed with authentic accounts of 
American experience or attempts thereat, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm very, very attracted to American Renaissance authors like obviously Melville and to, um, you know, frontier diaries and Westerns and things that I really could not have cared less about in my Europhile youth. So McCarthy obviously looms large there. The third and final reason is that I chose it especially for you, because it seems to me that this novel in particular particular is really engaging with the sacred and profane in uh, at least as intense a way as life and death, and in particular, the, the question of the sacred. Right. The, and we'll get to that as we go on. Um, but I thought this was a really, really interesting test case for you and me to talk about literature that might be dismissed or thrown to the other side of the room by many people as being simply too profane and too down in the dirt to have anything to do with, um, with, uh, uh, the transcendent, or even with virtue. <laughs> and I wanted right. to test your intuitions about that in respect to this novel. Yeah, well, I mean, not to be a narcissist, but just to jump to the third reason, namely in <laughs> relation to me. Yeah, I mean, I can't thank you enough for choosing this novel, because I I don't know that I would have gotten around to reading it. But yeah, it really, it really strikes at the heart of some of the things I've been thinking about for a while. Mm. And yeah, I mean, it is this novel that just really gets into the muck. Literally, yeah, that's a good word. And sort of yeah. like the seedy underbelly mm -hmm. of a city. Mm -hmm. um, it's literally described as a kind of hell, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. sort of symbolically. And then just um, literally yeah. at, at various points. And so, you know, one of the questions is what, what is he doing with that? But, mm -hmm. um, but yet it is, infused with religious meaning and symbolism mm -hmm. and in particular the catholic symbolism mm -hmm. is as everywhere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's unclear it's it's unclear where it ends up frankly yeah yeah and yeah. part of it is because the the main character Satri mm -hmm. is is a difficult character to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. on the one hand he's a he's like a christ-like figure mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. really obvious ways mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and we can talk about those ways but then mm -hmm. on the other hand it's almost like you know he's i mean he's he's going out to to the outcasts mm -hmm. and the left behind mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. in the in the way that christ really would but he's not He's not bringing them good news. Right, 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 he's, right. He's not talking to them about their yeah. salvation. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there is that one scene where he ends up at the the, the baptismal ceremony for yes. born again Christians in the Tennessee mm -hmm. River, and um, he, and one of them asks him, "Are you uh, going to be baptized too?" And he says, "No, I already have been." That's, I think, one of the first. I might be wrong here, but one of the first explicit kind of self-identifications as a Catholic or a lapsed Catholic, mm -hmm. um, where yeah. you start to get a bit of a sense of what his background is. But there are so few actual bits of information strewn throughout the novel about what he's doing on a riverboat, um, why he left his family, why right. he's um, distanced from his parents, and so on, that just leaves it up to our imaginations. Yeah, it's very, um, you know, he's such a, I mean, um, he's, he's a wonderful character, mm. I, I, I should say. I think he's wonderful. But it is so difficult because he, he you know, he's not, <laughs> we we don't know the why like we yeah. don't know his motives yeah and and even more importantly we don't know his purpose yeah right yeah. like he doesn't seem to have 
an end goal right. in any of this. Right, right. And right. he's sort of like, you know, he's living this life by the river. He li- mm-hmm. he lives in this like river shanty mm-hmm. or or he lives in some kind of like river shanty town. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the river seems to be some kind of metaphor mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. general. And it's like you know, he, he just kind of goes with the flow, yeah. right? It's sort of like he lives this very reactive mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. It's like, where where's the current taking me now? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm with this family, like, searching for river pearls. Okay, yeah. I'll do yeah. that for a bit. Right. But for now a while, I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but then they, but then, you know, that ends in catastrophe. So yeah. I'll just row away. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. And for a while, maybe the first third of the book or so, you keep expecting these um, affairs he gets wrapped up in to be going somewhere. And then they fall apart and he shambles back to his riverboat and 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 something else just lands in his lap after that. But I just wanted to say about the river, I mean, this is something that always impresses me about Cormac McCarthy is what an incredible, I don't want to say just landscape writer, but more than that, I mean, how much he makes the earth and its natural features part of the story. And this is really clear in his description of, you know, the terrains and the the sudden lightning storms of the Southwest and so on in Blood Meridian. But I have never been so entranced before. In fact, I've I've often said before, I don't know why people are interested in rivers, but Mm -hmm. his account of the Tennessee River and of the geology of Knoxville around Mm -hmm. the river and the kind of the caves and underground passages that Harrogate goes through, and we'll get to Harrogate soon, I hope, Mm -hmm. um, is just so compelling. Telling, um, that really, I, I have never had such a strong sense that I have to go and, you know, see Knoxville. Like I never cared about <laughs> Knoxville yeah. before. Yeah. And uh, so the description of the river, I think, that starts in the very first pages with them pulling up an unidentified dead body out of the water. And right. then there I can think of at least one other really gruesome case of another dead body in the in the river later in the story. And then the way they're just constantly pulling uh, kind of the congealed muck of the river up in the form of fishes and turtles and river mussels and so on. I I feel like it sets the, it's, it's sets the environmental tone for the whole novel. It's like, it's disgusting, (laughs) Um, um, but it's what our life is actually like. And this is, that is to say, like a river in the ways I've just evoked. And this is something that Sutri seems to have accepted, whereas people living in proper homes um, uh, further from the water are, so to speak, shutting it out. Yeah, no, it's incredibly poetic. Um, I mean, he, I mean, first of all, I had to look up it probably at least 250 words in this book. I was like, what the hell is he talking about? Yeah. Um, so just his vocabulary is astonishing. Can I say something there? I mean, you know, some people have noticed that this is an early McCarthy novel because mm-hmm. it's, it it's, I mean, it, like stylistically early for a number of reasons. And one of them is that here and then in Blood Meridian, but then not in the, the Border Trilogy and certainly not in The Road, in this early novel or these early novels, you get this incredibly Baroque vocabulary, Mm -hmm. like someone who clearly just, you know, studied the 
complete Oxford English Dictionary and mm -hmm. and memorized it and mm -hmm. internalized it and is ready to just lay it all on us. And if I can just make one quick interlude about the road, I know we're not talking about that either, but, you know, the road is very sparing language, as sparing as yeah. the environment itself. And most of the dialogue in the road is just the man talking with his boy in very simple sentences. But there's right. one line where he shoots the other guy who whom he perceives as a threat. And right. this explosion of sophisticated vocabulary comes pouring from his mouth about what's going to happen in the guy's brain as the bullet goes through his head. And you're just <laughs> like, whoa, where did this, where did this rich vocabulary come from? And when I think about that moment in the road, it's like, it's like he's like Cormac McCarthy preserved that kind of speaking from 1979 and then it just comes out again post-apocalypse but here in Sutri what's also remarkable about this florid vocabulary is that basically everybody all of the characters are themselves a bunch of borderline mutes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, right? And nobody has any kind of gift of the gab, except maybe, well, there are some, maybe some exceptions there. So then you start to wonder, like, when you see this incredible vocabulary, like, who is it that's speaking here, right? And obviously it's an omniscient narrator and, and we, we can offer up an easy answer to that. But it's almost like what I feel like saying is that this, this very complex, dense vocabulary drawing on the whole history of the English language is like actually McCarthy trying to make like the world itself speak and trying to in particular make the geography of the river and the environment and all of nature speak by using the most kind of obscure knowledge of natural processes, of weather transformations, things like this, to make us feel like, yeah, this is, this is what the world does. Um, and that's a that's a remarkable technique. I can't think of any other author who does that quite so compellingly. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've seen some people criticize it mm. as sort of like juvenilia, mm -hmm. and he hadn't come into his mature style, and mm. he's still, you know, beholden to this or that writer. But I personally thought it was incredibly beautiful, yeah, and captivating. I mean, he just made gutting a fish yeah or getting a bloated corpse out of a river <laughs> like yeah. seem genuinely contemplative yeah. like beautiful poetic yeah. moments in yeah. human life yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah and i mean i i often had to stop and just read it out loud yeah, yeah. just to hear it because it was like musical and yeah yeah. I mean, I there, don't know. there might be something juven, a juvenilia like quality about it in that he's showing off, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And he learns to be more restrained, though. I think his restraint in the Border Trilogy is like, you know, I need to write. Well, I shouldn't say this because, I mean, McCarthy is famously, you know, behind the curtains. You're never really going to mm -hmm. know. But I mean, All the Pretty Horses was transformable into a movie with Matt Damon and Penelope Cruz. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no way you're going to do that with Sutri, right? And right. so I kind of feel like the more accessible language of, say, All the Pretty Horses was a commercial turn and oh, really? it, 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 yeah, it's, 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 I, I don't want to say he's, he was only out for filthy lucre because I also think all the pretty horses is a, is a remarkable novel. Um, but there was a definite turn to some kind of greater accessibility in the mid 1980s. And then by the time we get to the road, it's just, you know, he's just kind of got this streamlined minimalism and I don't think, he cares if it 
if it's commercially viable or not, right? right. But what we have in Sutri is indeed this kind of um, Faulkner-esque young man who is showing off how much he has, how much he's mastered this kind of extreme edge of the American tradition, right? Um, right. But I would say, unlike Faulkner, um, and I've, I've seen people mention that about Sutri as well, Honestly, you know, I had a lot of trouble following what was going on in The Sound and the Fury, for example. I was always like, okay, who's this guy again? What's happening here? And what's incredible about Sutri is that even if you don't know their backgrounds, even if he never says explicitly that, you know, such and such character is someone who runs an illegal bar, such and such other character practices, African-American traditions of divination and spellcraft. It's like you just always know right right off the bat who someone is and what they're doing there. And I don't know how I, I'm able to know that, but I never felt with Satri that it was experimental in the sense of being impenetrable, right? In fact, I felt like right. I was right there with him on the houseboat and <laughs> in the muck, and um, and that I I always knew instinctively and immediately what the situation was, just like I would know if I were in a down and out bar or a brothel or, you know, any number of other places he describes, you just know, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so, so, so I find that really a remarkable accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And it's a different sort of accomplishment than the later novels, but it would be hard for me to call it juvenilia. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, I also felt like one thing that really stood out to me is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 it feels like a Cormac McCarthy novel, but it also kind of doesn't feel like mm-hmm. a Cormac McCarthy mm-hmm. novel, but it seemed more ambitious mm-hmm. liter- uh, in a literary sense. Yeah. Like you could definitely like snuff out a lot of literary illusions. Yeah. And you, you could, you know, from like Yeats to Dante to, mm-hmm. I mean, Joyce is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Just, sure. Just sure. Everywhere here. Yeah. And obviously I'm, um, not the first person <laughs> to see see that. I mean, it's mm. pretty um, it, it's pretty upfront. Yeah. And I, you know, it's kind of like it's sort of like he's trying to do for Knoxville mm. what Joyce did for Dublin. Oh, interesting. Yeah. In Ulysses, yeah. I mm-hmm, mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I have spent time in Knoxville. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so I can say, I mean, I've never lived there. Mm. Certainly didn't live in a shanty town on the river. But um, so the, the Knoxville that I've seen has mostly been around the university, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. But, but he does, I mean, he, he does like infuse the city of Knoxville yeah. with this kind of mythic yeah. importance yeah. that is like really impressive. Right. Right. Um, because based, on its face, yeah. like Knoxville just, doesn't really seem like an interesting place. <laughs> right, 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 right. It, it, it had not previously been on my on my list of right. places to visit. Um, yeah, and I, I love it in the beginning when when young Jean Harrogate intends to escape from prison and to disappear into Knoxville um, is so big that surely the police will never find him. Um, yeah. So the country boy's view of Knoxville as the great city with a capital C is really remarkable. Right. Yeah. Right. Can we talk about the first two pages of this novel? Oh yeah. 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 So the, so the first two pages of this novel are italicized and it's sort of like, Oh, well, I don't know. Actually, it's a little bit hard to describe. I mean, we are, we are addressed. Yeah. By dear friend now yeah. in the dusty clockless hours of the town right mm-hmm. what what it, what is going on here i don't have a particularly good theory of what's going on um it's clearly in a different voice uh than the rest of the novel it's like 
hard to believe, but it's almost like, um, you know, uh, the, 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 well, I don't want to say a different voice, but the same voice just ramped up to an even more kind of impenetrable and lofty register, right? Describing, I think here setting the environmental tone, I think, um, telling us, who the main character is, which is to say the Tennessee River, the world of the Tennessee River, Mm -hmm. without yet introducing any characters. I think Mm -hmm. that's the main purpose. And I hadn't thought about it much before, but um, it's uh, in this preface uh, or this opening invocation, (laughs) um, or I don't know how you would describe it, uh, uh, maybe even, yeah, uh, dedicatory epistle that you get into the, the, the climate and the, the, the real milieu of the novel before the char- characters are introduced. Yeah. And it, I mean, it sets a, it sets a real tone. So, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, he talks about a world within a world, but he also says, you know, this place where we're going Mm -hmm. It's a darker town, past lamps, stone blind, past smoking, oblique shacks and china dogs and painted tires where dirty flowers grow, down pavings rent with ruin, the slow cataclysm of neglect, the wires that belly pole to pole across the constellations hung with kite string with bolos composed of hobbled bottles or the toys of the smaller children, encampment of the damned. Right? And... You know, he also says, we are come to a world within the world and these alien reaches, these mauger sinks and interstitial wastes that the righteous see from carriage and car, another life dreams, ill-shapen or black or deranged, fugitive of all order, strangers in every land. And And then he finally says, this is the final paragraph, a curtain is rising on the Western world. A fine rate of soot, dead beetles, anonymous small bones. The audience sits webbed in dust. Within the gutted sockets of the interlocutor's skull, a spider sleeps, and the jointed ruins of the hanged fool dangle from the flies, bone, pendulum, and motley. Four-footed shapes go to and fro over the boards. Ruder forms survive. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's quite an opening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I wonder um, who the interlocutor is here. I I hadn't really thought about that. Is it is it is, is it us who are uh, sitting here with spider webs in our skulls? Um, uh, uh, I I I don't know. It's quite an opening. It sets the tone. I have trouble interpreting it. Yeah, I mean, it seems. Well, I don't like. I said, I'm I'm barely. I mean. I usually don't really understand a novel until I've read it two or three Mm. times. I guess I'm just like a slow person Mm. and I've only read this once, but you know, it does, it does seem important that it's an encampment of the damned. Yeah. 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 When you, uh, when you emphasized that it really, uh, that's really what um, convinced me of your, and the, the correctness of your initial statement of the, relationship of this book to Dante and the kind of sense of a descent into hell. And I had that also certainly in the many uh, somewhat comic passages featuring Harrogate, who is um, the 18 year old um, country yokel um, whom Satri first meets in a work camp where they're both Uh imprisoned. And then when Harrogate gets released from the work camp, he sets up in some kind of hovel near the river, near where Satri lives, in order to be close to him, and has some kind of, you know, some kind of parent-child or sponsor-mentee relationship Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. Satri that's very affecting. And Harrogate is frequently portrayed as you know, comically naive, but also good-hearted, pure, in a way that also sits 
difficultly with his many dangerous and harmful schemes, mostly mm-hmm. to kill animals in order to eat them, including mm-hmm. shocking shocking pigeons, using, uh, I guess, electrical wires, stealing pigs and slaughtering them with his own hands, and then ultimately blowing up some dynamite in the caves under Knoxville that, I, as I recall, Satri tells him about first, right? right. And yeah. so then you get not just um, the encampment of the damned along the surface of the river, but you also have a city beneath the city right. that is, in some respects, its mirror image or, you know, it calls to mind depictions of catacombs in other cities. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's um, certainly a dark place, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, so I think Harrogate, I, I mean, I can't quite know what to make of Harrogate. And in a way, I was disappointed in his ultimate outcome. I I kept wanting to see him grow somehow, but I mm-hmm. think what we instead have is just a kind of growth of the comic effect of each of his new schemes. And mm-hmm. that actually kind of frustrated me. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know why, but certainly his descent beneath Knoxville is the time where I had the strongest sense of, let's say, in- infernal metaphors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, especially when, so so Harrogate, well, so first of all, Harrogate ends up in prison yeah. because he's trying to have sex with watermelons. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or arguably he succeeds. Like, I was just, dying reading that and everyone's like looking at me I'm, I'm just like falling off the couch <laughs> once you realize like what's going on you're like wait what yeah um but then yeah. I mean yeah but then you know it's like he's moving up this I also thought he was going to murder someone at some point because it starts out he's raping raping watermelons and then and Water- then he and watermelon then he, violation yeah, but then he goes on to um, to massacre a pig with his bare hands, and so it's hard not to think, oh, he's go- he's going to murder someone next. But yeah. uh, and on the other hand, he's so good natured, like like when he's at the at the at the farmers market and he steals a peach out of a woman's purse, and. Um, and she and she notices and she's hitting him over the head and he's just saying, dang, shit, <laughs> goddamn, stop. <laughs> like, um, like you get the sense that he um, he he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't like he, he could really do no harm, even if he's mm-hmm. doing horrible things right. <laughs> somehow. Right. And that makes him such an affecting character. Um, right. And such a, such, such an ambiguous character between, uh, between, uh, uh, between good and bad or difficult to map morally mm-hmm. speaking mm-hmm. in, in a way that I, I just found absolutely fascinating. Even if like at the end, I felt like, like maybe, that was one of the things, one of the only things that disappointed me about the novel that that McCarthy kind of used him as as comic fodder, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I don't, like I said, I I, I don't have a clear line about any of this. But mm-hmm. one thing that I'm kind of struggling to get a sense of with this novel is, I mean, on the one hand. Cormac McCarthy has drawn these larger than life characters that are some of the best characters of Southern grotesque fiction, Mm. you know, just uh, unbelievably wild freakish Mm. uh, characters um, that are also deeply human Mm -hmm. um, and lovable, but like, Mm. you know, um, but but just but just very very strange and doing things that are very disturbing yeah. and weird and and so it re- he reminds me so much of Flannery O'Connor yeah. in that respect. But unlike Flannery, he's not really redeeming these characters. Right. Yeah, or it's unclear that he. I mean, 
you know, he sort of paints them in a, in a, in a humanizing way. Yeah. And he definitely is meeting them where they are. And there's a sense of acceptance of them. Yeah. Especially yeah. from Sotri. Like, yeah. he's not judging them. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah. they're also not really, they don't ever really seem to transcend. No, no, on the contrary. Yeah. And yeah. I don't really know what to do with that. Well, I mean, I guess that's that's an interesting question for you and something that I that I don't have an answer to, but that I think about a lot. And I should say, and you'll be, you'll be tr- tremendously disappointed in me. I've never read Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> um, oh, I, this is just well. not, um, I, and I, I kind of only r- recently learned what a serious lacuna this is in my reading. So I'll, I'll get to her soon enough. I promise. Um, but, and I, I loved that recent Piece, I believe you circulated about her hillbilly Thomism. <laughs> just the, the yeah. phrase itself is just wonderful. Um, but now here's a question, and I, I don't know how to answer this. Like one way you can write a novel of faith, so to speak, is by depicting a world without it, right? Uh, uh, showing... Um, you know, showing what happens. Um, you know, I thinking in particular of his brief visit to the church. You remember yeah. those lines where he yeah. meets the he meets the priest, and um, yeah. the priest asks him if he's there to confess, and he says, uh, "No way." Um, mm-hmm. And you know, in the same in the same tone that he had dismissed the the person at the at the evangelical baptismal ceremony, and um, then the priest says. Well, it says, uh, this is the end of the chapter. The priest gave a little smile, lightly touched with censure, remonstrance gentled. God's house is not exactly the place to take a nap, he said. It's not God's house. I beg your pardon? It's not God's house. Oh? Satri waved his hand vaguely and stepped past the priest and went down the aisle. The priest watched him. He smiled sadly, but a smile for that. Right. And actually, the priest's sad smile, but a smile for that, as really, really encapsulates maybe the whole mystery we're trying to unravel here. Right. So so Satri does not take this opportunity of, uh, you know, coming up close to contact with um, with something or some power that could save him from his condition. He rejects it and he runs out. Um, and nonetheless, the priest recognizes something worth smiling at in that character, nonetheless. Um, but otherwise, it's just a world of, you know, fallen, hopeless, lost people. Um, and um, so, you know, the, 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 the meta question then is, can you make a compelling a uh, uh, kind of portrayal of the kind of world an author like Flannery O'Connor would want to portray as well, but by subtracting um, the part that O'Connor thinks needs to be there. Does that make sense? Right, N- namely Grace. <laughs> namely Grace, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, so I think, you know, the the nod to hillbilly Thomism that is from one of Flannery O'Connor's letters. She mm, says mm. everybody everybody complains about my novels, you know, and mm. and they say why does she write such why does she write such violent fiction, you know? <laughs> and people say that I'm a hillbilly nihilist, you know, <laughs> but they don't understand me. I'm a hillbilly Thomas, and she <laughs> said I write Wonderful. happy stories. Yeah. She was like, I write happy stories about redemption and grace. And and I think that's true. I think that's obviously true that she mm-hmm. she writes happy stories, happy in a Catholic sense, you know. <laughs> not like not like smiley, you yeah. know, happy go lucky happy, but uh, a deeper tortured happiness. Yeah. Um and you know, but a lot of people say that Cormac McCarthy is a nihilist. And when I said that I was going to do a podcast on Sutri, people were like, oh, why would you do that? It's so sad. It's so yeah. dark. Yeah. And I don't, 
At first, I did think it, I thought it was funny a lot of the time yeah. and sort of, I mean, look, sometimes it was kind of brutally sad, but I, I'm not sure if it's nihilistic. I, I often feel like too many things are called nihilist mm-hmm. and that that is a pretty um, uh, first degree reading of mm-hmm. almost anything that gets called by that name. Mm-hmm. Um, even the Russian nihilists were not nihilists. They were out to achieve <laughs> something. Like even yeah. the people who um, who accepted the title were out to, out to mm-hmm. achieve something. And... Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, 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 so I, I hesitate to use that term for anything, but certainly not this, because in part, as you say, it's funny, it's touching. Satri um, is a character with a lot to commend him, with a deep affection for other human beings, Um that comes through uh, all of the terror and the darkness. Um, and again, you know, this is encapsulated in that, but there's a smile nonetheless phrase about the, mm-hmm. about the priest from whom Satri runs away. Like you can still um, get something uh, endearing um, in this, even in this fallen world. Now, I don't mm-hmm. know if the, if the purpose then is to say, you know, this is as good as it gets, we might as well enjoy it, um, uh, even if it's mostly horrible, um, mm-hmm. or if it's rather to say, there's something missing here. <laughs> we can't right. tell you what it is, um, uh, right. because because yeah. we're because we're mute idiots in, in our fallen state. But I don't know. I don't know. But either way, it's a more complex world than just. Uh, sheer nihilism. I think one of the most affecting scenes for me, um, well, it's a pair of scenes. First of all, he describes his memory of having been taken turtle hunting on the Tennessee yeah. River as yeah. a as a boy with a man, but we're never told who it is, um, who just likes to shoot the heads off turtles and then leave mm-hmm. them dead. And mm-hmm. then he later meets a Native American man who says, who tells him that he can make a great turtle soup. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And, you know, uh, Satri says, oh yeah, I've been turtle hunting before, but I've never learned how to crack open the shell uh, and get the meat out of it. Um, So he gets taken out, they shoot off the head. There's a very gruesome description of cracking the shell open and then the black blood pouring out. and, um, And then they're kind of, quiet, stoic procedure that this Native American man goes through uh, to build a campfire and, and cook turtle soup. Mm-hmm. And then they just sit there and look at, the, look at the sky together and exchange a few insignificant words. Um, mm-hmm. And there's such a deep serenity and decency in what they're doing, even though it also came out of something gruesome and horrible a turtle being cracked open um and so you know that is a small moment of grace of the natural (laughs) variety if you're willing to call it that um and again that's maybe the kind of grace that deserves just a just a sad smile (laughs) as the priest says i don't know um but i I, yeah yeah, there are all of these moments yeah. where you would want to say that there is like real communion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and just to pick up like I began pretty early on to kind of see Sutri as this Christ-like figure mm-hmm. because part of his backstory, which I don't think we've mentioned yet, is that Sutri is not himself a native river rat, right? right he right is from a middle-class family. He, I, I think, is educated. Yeah. And he abandons his wife and his child and his family, like a, like a, like a young child, to descend into this, you know, underworld. We're never really told why he does mm. this. And if you think about, you know, Christ and the harrowing of hell, Mm -hmm. right? Christ descends into hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 
And of course, Dante also descends into hell, but they descend into hell with a purpose, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, they leave hell, both of them, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to go to a place where, you know, there is eternal happiness and, and, is, the, and is literally the opposite of hell. Mm-hmm. Now, Sutri, I think, right, is, is never going to leave. And we don't know why he went down in the first place. Yeah, right, right. And then right. there are all these other, like, imitations of Christ. Even mm-hmm. when he goes to the church and gives mm-hmm. the priest a hard time and says that God is not here. I mean, mm-hmm. there are, uh, there it sort of reminds me of scenes in the Gospels when, mm-hmm. you know, Christ is giving the rabbis a hard time and the Pharisees a hard time and he's mm-hmm. turning over the month, you know, like, yeah. you know, saying this isn't, this isn't where God is. This isn't yeah, God's right, house. He's right. not saying there is no God. He's right, saying this right, isn't right. God's house. Right. You know, but. But the central respect in which he's not like Christ is Mm. the sense in which he's not offering, he's not saving anyone. Right. right. He's not offering them hope. And it's not clear that he himself is living in hope Mm. of any kind. He's kind of just, like I said, he's kind of like flotsam being carried about by the river. Yeah, yeah. And it's deeply unclear why he left. And he, you know, he finds out that his son died. Right. And he watches the, so he like goes back to Mm -hmm. try to, I think, talk to his wife, his Mm -hmm. ex-wife, his abandoned wife. And the father and the mother won't let him. What an intense scene. Yeah. Yeah. And he watches, and this is pretty early on, and he watches Mm -hmm. the funeral, watches his son be buried like, from behind a tree or something Mm -hmm. from someplace else in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And then he goes and visits the grave by himself. And it's a really harrowing, beautiful scene. And, and and it's just sort of like unclear why, like, is he running away? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It like, what is going on there? I just didn't know if you had a (laughs) kind of insight Um, there. I mean, that was such an intense moment where he comes up, to his ex-wife or his abandoned wife's family home with her parents there and it quickly escalates into a physical fight and mm-hmm. uh and and with nearly no words at all spoken you mm-hmm. get a whole kind of sense of uh world of hurt um, Mm -hmm. in uh, what he did to that family in abandoning them. We don't know how his abandonment is related to the baby's death or how the baby died or anything. Um, We don't know if the family is mad at him because of something in his abandonment that led to the baby's death or just because of the abandonment itself. It's not clear, um, but it's clear that his abandonment was not total, right? Because obviously he is um, uh, absolutely determined to be at the funeral and is in mourning at least for a while. I mean, then that chapter closes and we don't hear anything about it again. Um, And it's also from the sheriff who uh, escorts him out of town at the, um, at the request of the, um, the abandoned wife's father Mm -hmm. that we learn that uh, Satri is an educated fancy boy rather than um, rather than a, a, a real person uh, mm-hmm. when the sheriff says something like, I'm never going to let my daughter anywhere near that university, presumably right. being yeah. the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, right. where mm-hmm. Cormac McCarthy himself took classes before mm-hmm. dropping out. So that's where we get a little bit of a picture of who... Uh, of of the backstory, but really not much. We don't know. I mean, you know, I know some medieval nuns abandoned their families, you know, for uh, religious reasons. Um, But we don't really know uh, if we can uh, see this abandonment as the ultimate treachery, as as the wife's family evidently does, or if it was for some 
a deeper reason that could be justified if we were ever to learn something about it, right? Um, but uh, then again, uh, that episode just um, uh, floats into the past fairly quickly, and then we never hear about the sun again. And you get the sense that after that scene, his being adrift uh, must be further compounded by the trauma of his son's loss, but don't expect him to say it explicitly, right? <laughs> um, I suppose. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, from a Catholic perspective, it's fine to leave your family to follow Christ. Christ mm -hmm. himself says that you should mm -hmm. do that. That you should, yeah. And you can yeah. do that in ways that are like small and uninteresting, and you can do it in ways that are large right. and startling. Right. But you'd have to be following Christ. Right, right. <laughs> and and Sotri's not doing that. No, no. Yeah, I mean, so to return to this question about the sacred mm -hmm. in this novel, the thing about Sotri is that he's he's descended into hell, mm -hmm. and we don't know why. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if he's ever leaving. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear if he knows why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so the people who see the novel as nihilistic mm -hmm. will seize on this and say, yeah, you know, there is no meaning to mm. it. And of course, he almost dies at the end. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. He has this like crazy fever dream. Right, right. It's some, I think that it's typhoid fever, um, yeah. if I understood correctly. Yeah, that's right. That, he has this yeah. crazy fever dream with like visions. Mm. I don't know. Should we talk about that? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, that that part of it. That, you've read it more recently than I have. It's been a few months for me for now, and um, that part was um, not the most affecting for me. Um, uh -huh. uh, uh, and also, I mean, it's one of the weird things about reading a novel, unlike watching a movie, is that you can feel how many pages are left, um, and right. so yeah. so you always know how soon things are going to have to get wrapped up, you know? Uh -huh. And and my thought at that point was kind of like, do we really have to get be, be thrown into these depths now? <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, and I, I, I resented the typhoid fever in a way that I did not resent some of the, the earlier chapters, earlier oh, incidents. Oh, really? I mean, yeah. So you don't, yeah. So you don't like the ending? Um, well, I mean, I, he, I, we, his friend comes and picks him up and takes him away. And in spite of what you say, I think, I mean, we do get some kind of sense of his departure, right? He's done with the river life um, uh, at the very end. Um, and we don't know what he's going off to, but it seems like the fever breaks him of these past years right well there's a there's a dead body in his yeah, yeah, river yeah, shanty yeah so like he can't stay there anymore right 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 maybe that's um, what does it but it's also another question whose body is this <laughs> i thought you right, might have no some idea. ideas um i thought I, that, that was one of the moments where i thought i might have missed something um um uh, uh how did the dead body end up there uh, and there's also the whole rather comical story of his friend's, um, uh, father who dies and he and his mother keep the body because they need to keep getting his monthly welfare checks. And then six months go by and they start to have, uh, problems keeping the dead body around so he asks Satri what should I, what should we do I need your help throwing him into the river and mm -hmm. Satri says no I, I can't be a part of this but eventually he helps him and then the body comes back up from underneath the river um, and this is this is ex as grotesque as the novel gets but it's also more comical it's this is like you know uh uh almost slapstick um, uh, tone 
of trying to get the body to the bottom of the river. But somehow I got lost at the very end when mm. a body showed up in the houseboat. And I thought, is that that friend's dad again? <laughs> I right. didn't quite know what to think. Um, but I, I thought, I actually thought in contrast with, with you, I actually thought there was some kind of hint of, um, of redemption in that he was kind of going off into, into the sunset to start something new. Um, and also because of the autobiographical echoes of the, of, um, the novel in McCarthy's own life, I thought that, um, that this represented, um, the end of some funk that McCarthy himself had actually uh, been through after dropping out of the University of Tennessee for a few mm-hmm. years. But maybe I'm wrong. Well, I mean, I think you're not wrong that it's semi-autobiographical. So mm. Cormac McCarthy um, was born in Providence, Rhode Island, mm. but grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee from the age of four. And he did go to Tennessee, Knoxville, for like a year or two before he just dropped out and he, he did grow up Catholic in Knoxville. So he would have been like a, a really extreme religious minority, mm. even more so than, than Flannery. Yeah. Because, you know, there was longstanding Irish Catholic enclave in Savannah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there was an established counterpart in, in Knoxville. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And yeah, so I do think um, that there are all of these parallels. Mm-hmm. So does he leave at the end? I mean, yeah. So he, so he discovers this dead body in his river shanty, and he's like, okay. So he he comes out of the fever dream. He has typhoid fever, and he he, he ends up getting last rites. Right, this, mm-hmm. this priest comes to give him right, last rites because right. mm-hmm. his friends thought that he was dying, and they knew he was a Catholic. You know, so they mm-hmm. sent him mm-hmm. the sent him the priest. But also, like his fever dream involves like a trial, right? You know, where, right, where he's right, being right. judged, right, right, right. That seems significant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? of course, of course, yeah. And then he's given last rites, um, although you know he doesn't accept them, and also he doesn't die. Mm-hmm. Right. But uh, this is like the last two pages. He had yeah. a small, he had a small cardboard suitcase, and he came out of the weeds and sat on the edge of the road and straightened up and began combing his hair. He looked about his appearance, propping one foot on the case and bending to scrape beggar lice from his trousers, new trousers of tan chino, a new shirt open at the neck, right? Mm. And yeah, you know, he he gets in the car. Uh, out across the land, the light wires and road rails were going and the telephone lines with voices shuttling on like souls. Behind him, the city lay smoking, the sad purlieus of the dead and mirrored with the bones of the friends of friends mm. and forebears. Mm-hmm. Off to the right side, the white concrete of the expressway gleamed in the sun where the ramp curved out into empty air and hung truncate with iron rods bristling among the vectors of nowhere. Mm-hmm. When he looked back, the water boy was gone. An enormous mm-hmm. lank hound had come out of the meadow by the river like a hound from the depths and was sniffing at the spot where Citri had stood. Mm. Which also reminds me of, you know, the three-headed dog at the gates of hell. Mm-hmm. But then the last paragraph here, somewhere in the gray wood by the river is the huntsman and then the brooming corn and in the castellated press of cities. His work lies all wares and his hounds tire not. I have seen them in a dream, yeah. slaverous and wild, and their eyes crazed with ravening for souls in this world. Fly them. Fly them. Yeah. Then yeah. that, that what, what is going that, on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, even grammatically, that last two-word sentence is unclear. Is it? Is it a transitive verb? Um, mm-hmm. uh, a, a command. Fly them. Or mm-hmm. is it more that they are flying? It's really um uh kind of ending on a on a note that is as um as difficult to process as the as the opening um the opening 
invocation. Is it okay? But is it possible that the dead body and the shanty is so tree? Is it like at all possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I was <laughs> I was tempted by that thought uh, a, at the beginning. And so, what? This is his soul, uh, just uh, making a making a final tour of the. I mean, we uh, don't know who that dead body is. Yeah, right. Yeah. And he, we knew that he had typhoid fever. I mean, I don't know. It yeah. depends on like how. It, it depends on how you want to read this novel. And I haven't figured out how yeah. to read this novel quite yet. Yeah. But this novel does have all of this like mythic, mythic stuff going on. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know. I just, I don't know if that's a possible reading. It's also, it, it's also you know, notice I have seen them in a dream, uh, 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 slaverous and wild and their eyes crazed with, with ravening for souls in this world. Yeah. This yeah. is the, the first and only occurrence of the first person narration in the book as well, right? Yeah. It turn, turns to I all of mm-hmm. a sudden. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that thought crossed my mind for a split second when I learned of the dead body in the houseboat. But mm-hmm. then I thought I must have un- I must have misunderstood something. Maybe it's the old um, uh, uh, junk dealer uh, or the the homeless guy he visits from time to time. Uh, uh, who crawled into his houseboat to die? Because especially the 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 truly homeless guy uh, who has a, a campfire and lives outdoors and keeps saying, uh, you know, he's not long for this world. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of discussion and anticipation of his death, um, and so I thought it might be him, but. Mm-hmm. Your current theory that it's actually <laughs> Satri, um, and and that and that it's Satri's disembodied soul making a, a final tour of Knoxville um, that sees his body in the houseboat. I I like it. I like the way it sounds. It's yeah, pretty... I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud because I don't. Yeah. Like I said, I don't have a line on this novel yet, but it's very. It just struck me. I don't know. I mean, I mean, how much Dante is in it, how, mm-hmm. how much Joyce is in it, how much he like, like all of these illusions. And then it has this like mythic quality to it. Mm. It ends in like a fever dream. Yeah. And, you know, and, and there are these other, this happens in, in, in other Cormac McCarthy novels, you know, not yeah. in the same way, but like there is that famous, you know, it's like, what the hell is up with the judge? Yeah. He, he seems, not quite human in, right. in some deep way. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And then there's some really weird stuff going on there too. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess I'm just inclined to think that whatever interpretation you give to this novel, mm-hmm. the beginning and the end of it should should make should be mutually illuminating. You know. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, because yeah. in the beginning, right, we're told that we're descending into a world within worlds. And then at the end, you know, there's supposed to be some sense of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what, so the fly then. Yeah. Fly yeah. them is the souls, right? Yeah. What, what but it, I mean, ordinarily, if you, if you say them as the direct object of the verb to fly, then mm-hmm. it's a command that you fly something else transitively. Right. You don't say they, fl- he's not saying they fly, he's saying right. fly Right, right, he's saying fly them. And, and I, I don't know how to make sense of that. Like I said, even grammatically, I don't even know, know what he's trying to say. And so the last sentence is an utter enigma. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it it seems to again, you know, the second to last sentence is the first time we have first person narration and then the mm-hmm. final sentence seems to be a command, right? Right. Which right. is um yeah. which is really wild. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I think like maybe so but who knows? I mean, I definitely have to read this novel at least one more time before mm. I feel really confident in anything that I'm saying about it. But 
you know, it, it, it clearly is suffused with sacred imagery. Yeah. Sacred, you know, talk of souls mm-hmm. and, and talk of hell that seems to not just be, seems to be substantive, you know, what, yeah. whatever reading we have of it. Um, yeah. And so, and so while the novel is incredibly profane, just mm. a lot of violence and sex and debauchery <laughs> and mm-hmm. just just a very um, material form of existence because mm. he's in conditions of really extreme poverty where mm. people are forced to live at a, at a level of materiality that mm-hmm. that is really shocking. Mm-hmm. But because mm-hmm. they're just trying to literally maintain themselves. Right in whatever way they can, but it is infused with these kinds of sacred aspects. And, you know, I think for me, the the puzzling thing is, is, is where he's going with all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I haven't come across anything yet that really, I mean, I I looked at a couple of things Uh that, you know, were sort of intriguing, but it's just sort of like, well, you know, he's, he's trying to be the American Joyce or mm, something. Yeah. And it's like, well, maybe, but I mean, if that's all he's doing, it's not that interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can I bring up one ancestor that I, I think is important here? Yes. Um, and it's, I mean, in a way it's obvious um, uh, uh, because we know how important Melville is for McCarthy, uh, right. but I'm thinking in particular of the confidence man. Um, and uh, Blood Meridian reminds me of The Confidence Man, too, because, you know, the judge uh, is a diabolical character like the lead character of The Confidence Man. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, you know, who might in fact be the devil. We're never really told. But right. there's also something so claustrophobic um, about in this case, the Mississippi River, um, and the feeling that we're all screwed and we're all being conned um, just um, pervades the whole mood of the whole thing. And that, you know, in a sense, to me, I always read this as very allegorical for, you know, the kind of exploration of the theme of America. Right. Um, Confidence Man is trying to depict to us what the founding of America has cost, so to speak. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I kept I kept thinking about this with Sutri and, you know, the river doesn't feel claustrophobic in the same way. And Sutri himself doesn't seem like a diabolical character. You can no, call him something else, but he's got nothing to do with the judge or in from Blood Meridian or with the confidence man. Um, uh, but still, you know, there are moments, especially with all of the, the, um, the racial dimensions that we haven't even touched on and um, the, the, um, uh, the encounter with the Native American and the turtle soup, um, where you really do tr- get get some kind of a sense of uh, trying to um, epitomize America in a single spot, in a single mm-hmm. dense geographical location. Um, and uh, so, you know, thinking about that antecedent Um, And thinking about the, again, what I started with in our conversation, the ecological dimensions, I was less attuned than you are to to a lot of the the sacred themes, Um, even if um, uh, uh, even if I I knew you would be prepared to talk about them. (laughs) And also, you know, I think in some of some of McCarthy's other novels, like with especially Blood Meridian, you know, Conquering the Frontier, that's an obvious kind of preoccupation of people trying to get to the heart of American history. Also, All the Pretty Horses with that incredible scene at the end um, when he goes to see the Christian 
evangelical radio broadcaster who might have been the father of the lost Harrogate-like boy who was murdered in Mexico. And this man in this, you know, this Texan radio broadcaster at the dawn of kind of big, kind of, can't call it televangelism yet, but it's it's on the horizon. And his wife welcomes them and says, uh, you know, they hear my husband's radio broadcasts even in China, and I hear the signals go all the way to Mars. And I'm just so happy that people up there are learning the good news of our Lord. And right. She doesn't even know that there aren't people on Mars. She just knows that, you know, there's this amazing new technology that's broadcasting our power. Um, and some of that stuff in 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 McCarthy's later novels is such a powerful condensation of things that strike me as you know just in a single image telling you so much about American history and mm-hmm. I never really got a, such a strong sense of that from um from Sutri I didn't feel like he was trying to condense our country uh, into a single image or a single kind of a single um, uh, maybe uh, story. Um, But then I I think sometimes I think I might, I might be wrong about that. I, I, and I, I I have have to read it again like you do. Yeah. I mean, I sort of just on my first read of the novel, it just seems like an example of, you know, the, the Southern grotesque, yeah. And so it seems like a bit of regional writing. Yeah. But of course, but of course America is you know the the south is America yeah. in a sense. It just is a distinctive as someone who's lived in the south now yeah. for 8 years. Um Yeah, it's a, it's I mean it's a different it's it's a different world down here in in some obvious respects, but it also is very 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 American. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and I think that one thing that the kind of southern grotesque genre is doing, it's kind of the antidote, you know, to like Gone with the Wind. Yeah. It's this this kind of image of the South is like moonlight and magnolias. I mean, look. There's great moonlight and magnolias in the south, <laughs> right? But there's also tripping through the dew and and watermelon violating. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. River rats and yeah, and and I think that these authors who are drawn to the freaks, to the yeah. you know, to the outcasts, to the misfits, in mm. a way that Flannery is drawn to the freaks and the outcasts and the misfits, and and mm. so is Cormac McCarthy. And I do think of Cormac McCarthy as a Catholic novelist, not because mm-hmm. he's a professing Catholic, mm-hmm. but because it is a fact that his yeah. fiction is like Catholic haunted. Yeah, right, right. I right, mean, yeah. when he has religious imagery, it is super Catholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's not surprising because that's the religion that he was raised in. Yeah, um, right, But right. also like Catholicism <laughs> really takes evil very seriously. Yeah. And I think that Cormac McCarthy is, and maybe this gets to the difference with Pru- with like his beef with Proust. Yeah, I don't know. Right, right, yeah. But like Cormac McCarthy, like Flannery O'Connor, is really like bound up with the problem of evil, not in the mm-hmm. philosophical sense, but like there's mm-hmm. a contradiction there. Well, actually there's not a contradiction there, but you might perceive a contradiction there, but in the sense of, there's something very mysterious about evil. There's yeah. something that there's something there that is both extremely important, but quite difficult to have right. like a theory about or to, right. to, to make completely intelligible. Right. 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 Um, right. And I think there is something very Catholic about that, but I also think like you can't really be into evil mm-hmm. if you don't see it as the absence of some, Right. positive vision of the good right, right, right so i don't right, really right. think you can write about evil in a compelling way unless you right. are contrasting it with the thing that it's not right 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 
And when you think about it that way, I think so true becomes really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's my, that's my working theory. It's that it's, it's, you know, it's showing the negative case, right? Um, it's showing you just evil um, or, um, you know, again, I don't know if I'm using quite the right word, but it sounds right. Fallenness, um, yeah. turning, turning your back. Um and um, what the world looks like um, um, from that perspective, um, but not because you're you're actually tricked into believing that that's all there is, um, but just because it it's it's really important to describe it because it's evidently really important in human life, right? Right. Well, um, yeah, it's kind of always there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we are running out of time, so I will give you the last word. You can pick up whatever thread of this that you want. I don't know if you want to return to Proust or <laughs> Americana or the sacred um, and the profane or just introduce something new. But I'll yeah, just I, leave you with the final thought here. I, I keep saying these past years that I really like living in France because it's a wonderful opportunity to get my get to know my own country better. And a lot of people don't know what I'm talking about, but I insist that it's um it's it's it can be tremendously useful. I didn't like I didn't really start thinking about America until I came here. Um, right. And uh, uh, part of that is um, understanding myself better as a distinctly Western American. That is to say, as someone born in Reno, Nevada, with um, family spread around places like like Idaho and Arizona and 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 so on. Um, but one thing that I'm really and you know trying to work out what that means exactly and what you know the different historical legacies of, of America's different regions are. But you know what's so striking to me about this novel um, is that I had previously thought Cormac McCarthy was so good at uh, kind of depicting the legacy and the consequences of the frontier expansion, and therefore that he was geographically and thematically preoccupied mostly with the Southwest, pointing to the Southwest. And so it is indeed almost like... um, um, this novel comes up to remind me like wait a minute there's this other there's this other historical trajectory of the united states the south and it has an equal claim to being what made america what it is um let's dwell on that for a while right. and um and to me that's that's just such a um i mean it's not like i've never read any southern fiction before but um uh uh to me it's like I, I this is the first novel that has really made me feel the south in the in that in that powerful way and it's somewhat foreign to me because i've never lived there it's not part of my experience in the way the um the the novels about let's say broadly speaking what was once spanish america um mm-hmm. are part of me um Mm -hmm. but still i feel like it's like there's like this huge missing element and i just absolutely loved it and and i and i love being able to talk about it with you uh again in part because um because i trusted you would be able to bring uh uh the 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 sacred part whereas (laughs) i'm more (laughs) i'm more a specialist in the profane (laughs) Uh, you gotta have both but i'm I'm happy to be on brand uh so (laughs) so um i so i mean do you miss america well, yes and no. I mean, I miss uh, uh, I miss forty years ago <laughs> in <Right>. America. <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, here's a here's a Southern author for you, Thomas Wolfe. Right? You can't go mm-hmm. home again. <laughs> right. Um, right? Yeah. That's that's basically the feeling I have about America. It's like it's like well, it, you know, if I if I tried to go back, I wouldn't find it. <laughs> right. Well. If you do come back, and if you do, if you do come to Knoxville, 
Yeah, we'll have absolutely. To go. Yeah. I, yeah, I just right. found out this morning that Knoxville has these literary pub crawls that uh-huh. are based on Sotry. Oh, amazing. Uh, and, yeah. and they're like they're like fifteen hours long. And it's, <laughs> and it's like it, it's like it's like can you survive it? There's a subculture for everyone, isn't there? Oh, so, I <laughs> mean, come on! If you ever come, obviously we'll do Absolutely. it. Absolutely, we'll have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was it was a pleasure. Yeah, that was uh, a lot thanks. of fun. That went really well. Yeah, thanks. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a philosophy, theology, and literature podcast that is generously underwritten by the Institute of Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and produced by Catholics for Hire, a group of young Catholic digital content freelancers. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can just go to www.patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod to become a monthly subscriber. So many thanks go to my most recent pa- patrons. That includes David Riesbeck, Emily Rowe, Andrew Kay, Gabriel Herrera, Andrea Novakovic, Ross Hensley, Marcos Gouvea, John Wilson, Glenn Street, Hope Dahlgren, Luke Houchins, Matthew Healy, Ryan Stambaugh, and Lawrence Bloom. For our next episode, I will be joined by Thomas Hibbs, professor of philosophy at Baylor University to discuss Dostoevsky's crime and punishment. Until then, friends, be well and keep reading.